Is this the great storm that Trump supporters have been waiting for? What a chaotic and disorganized mess. Welcome to the Almost Daily Zencast special segment, Good Morning Trumptopia. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and good night to you. Thank you for tuning in from wherever you're tuning in from. I am your humble host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. This is the Almost Daily Zencast special segment, Good Morning Trumptopia. I should try and see if I can find the original file I created that intro with to edit the last bit, I say, because we're not so much talking about Trump these days, and but more so the people that Trump help empower into office. All right. So uh, welcome to the show. It's Thursday, January 5th. It's 2.56 p.m. over here in Pacific Standard Time. I'm lucky to be enjoying light and intermittent rain and not the crazy rainstorms of further north. Um, Before we launch into the political discussion, let's take a moment to pray for all those who are suffering through this intolerably weird winter without the resources to stay warm, safe, and comfortable. And um, let's push our representatives to do something about it. Okay, so what's been going on in Trumptopian politics? Uh, Well, friends, uh, the House GOP is making congressional history right now, has been for the last three days, um, as they utilize their razor-thin majority to do what? obstruct themselves. Now, for quite some time now, the GOP has been, by self-declaration, I believe it was Mitch McConnell who, who, who declared that they would be the party of obstructionism, right? That they would be the party of not letting the Democrats get anything done. Well, it seems that they've failed at that enough that now they've divided against themselves. Um... My first big question, which I I posted on social media, I think either at the end of the first logger jam day or somewhere in the middle of the second, is this. I'm I'm deeply curious to know whether or not Kevin McCarthy is questioning his choices, right? He must be wondering whether or not it was worth the time, effort, and self-humiliation Like, why has he bothered bending over backwards to suck up to and defend Donald Trump and to coddle his uh, MAGA mini caucus of, of, uh, of, of politicos, of political sycophants, which is what they are, um, you know, this whole time he's bent over backwards, uh, even before we got to this this fight for the speaker's gavel, McCarthy has refused to acknowledge his duplicity in holding Trump accountable. He, in the initial aftermath of January 6th, laid the blame directly on Trump and then did a complete flip-flop on that. Um, He's refused to hold uh, members of his caucus accountable for their outrageous behavior. Right, something we that has been discussed here and in plenty of other shows throughout, um, and now the result of all of his labor, he is reaping what he sowed, and it's it's kind of bizarre to me, but it also sort of in a way, in a very Trumpy way, makes perfect sense. Um, but this this current episode isn't working out the way either Trump or McCarthy thought it would or clearly would prefer it to work out, right? And it's fascinating. It's fascinating to me um, how 
well, we, I wanted to say this a little bit later. Um, but it fascinated me how Trump's endorsement of McCarthy throughout, and especially in during this this nomination fight, does not seem to have influenced any of the holdouts. They, they've not changed their minds, right? And these are not GOP members that have been contentious with Trump. The, the group that has formed around, you know, the internal opposition uh, argument, the group that has developed over the past three days, because it started out relatively small, strong enough to block McCarthy, but it's, it's ballooned up to 20. Um, and as of this, as of the, my last opportunity to check, Kevin McCarthy has lost 10 ballot votes. Okay. Hakeem Jeffries on the Democratic side has consistently won the most votes overall. And the opposition bloc, this 20 or so uh, group of Trumptopian uh, representatives elect, have remained strong in their opposition, have built momentum, but have also simultaneously bifurcated themselves in a couple of interesting ways. Um, it's bizarre. Uh, and after 10 losses in a row, Kent McCarthy seems resolutely immovable. Now, McCarthy himself has said that he's not budging on multiple occasions, right? At least reportedly so. To the best of my ability to follow this story, McCarthy has been consistent in stating he's not going to bow out. Now, curiously... He has conceded, apparently, reportedly, to every demand from this opposition bloc of, uh, of Trump-approved members of House. What did it get him? Apparently, absolutely nothing. As of my last um, check on the live feed, he's still losing. So as of right now, the... Uh, the House is either going to just keep repeating this exercise over and over and over again. Um, or, um, as of this moment, their only options are keep voting or adjourn, right? And as we saw yesterday, even, even voting to adjourn seems to be really difficult for McCarthy camp to achieve. Now, there's plenty of speculation as to what McCarthy wants to, to do during this time off. Um, for those who may not be aware, um, the Chamber of Congress, known as the House, cannot do anything. As, as things stand, as the House rules exist, they cannot do anything until they've elected and approved um, a House, uh, a Speaker of the House, so that they then can... Um, finalize the process of, of election for all the representatives elect. Now, plenty of incumbents are being called, you know, non-elect, but technically they're all floating in this limbo of being only representatives elect. They haven't been sworn in, right? And as things stand, they cannot move forward until this is resolved. Uh, and curiously, as uh, plenty of people have pointed out, um, all over the spectrum of, of those, you know, who are reporting on this, this hasn't happened in nearly a hundred years. And, uh, and it's only happened a few times in American history. I don't have those facts and figures in front of me. I apologize. Um, but from what I recall, somewhere in the 1800s, and this is off the top of my head, and I apologize as always if I'm wrong, because I don't pretend to run around, I don't run around pretending to be absolutely correct about absolutely everything, Right. This is an opinion show, not a, not a, a news report. Um, but apparently, um, in the 1800s at some point, it took over 100 rounds of voting, 100 different ballots, for the House to finally go, okay, we'll vote for this guy. Um, okay, so we are in a really interesting and strange historic moment. Camp McCarthy seems resolutely immovable, and Camp... MAGA seems completely intransigent. Like they, although they can't seem to agree amongst themselves, they are holding the line about not giving in to uh, what McCarthy would like to achieve. Despite, and this is the craziest part, 
despite McCarthy having conceded on every demand that they've made, according to reports, right? Including the craziest, most self-undermining thing that, that McCarthy could have ever agreed to in hopes of getting these people to switch their votes, their votes over to him. Their votes, their votes. That's a V, not a B. Um, and that's, he's conceded to them uh, the return of the single vote, um, uh, the single member vote of no confidence mechanism. Now, this mechanism has had, has changed a few times. Um, and curiously, both Democratic speakers and Republican speakers have maintained um, this and other policies in place that this opposition group wants to change. Some of the changes seem reasonable. Um, as one member of the holdout whose name I totally didn't catch uh, recently, a little bit earlier this morning, was pointing out, um, as things stand, either party can bring legislation to a vote with ridiculously insufficient amount of time for members of the House to read it all. Um, and what they want, which seems like a reasonable request, this one, is for an open debate with the possibility of amendments on the floor, as opposed to any amendments being negotiated out beforehand and closed, behind closed doors. Um, now, I haven't fully looked at and thought through all of the demands that they're making, so I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to be already experted up on what they're asking for. But the two big things that seem to be discussed in the reporting from all sorts of media channels, because I don't, I don't only monitor, you know, one side or the other. I try to take, you know, um, measurements or I take, take samples from all of them from, you know, as many sides of the, of the news media spectrum as I can possibly manage in, in the limited time that I have. Um, and so these two top issues um, the the vote of no confidence issue and the and the open floor amendment issue. Um, I, diff I have differing opinions on each, but cumulatively, what I wonder is do do these members who are demanding this realize that it will not grant them as holdouts as as the black sheep of the GOP any more power than they think they currently have, um, because these things apply equally to both parties from what I understand, right? Um, and something else that I, it's further down on my notes, but that comes to mind right now. I, I don't know that the GOP realizes either Camp McCarthy or Camp MAGA um, or, or Freedom Caucus, but whatever is the more accurate label, um, that they're going to need the Democratic Party in the ch House chamber to get real, meaningful, bipartisan legislation done, right? Now, I think that Camp MAGA has taken the sort of, this this conservative idea of, of fighting for only conservative legislation to an extreme that's undermining their own part, you know, the party that they're trying to, to become the leadership of, right? It's just going to undermine them. Um, at, at least that's my, inter you know, my interpretation of, of of, of my understanding of what they're demanding. But um, I could be wrong about that. Um, I, I would really have to spend a little bit more time um, looking at their demands more closely. Um, and that's been impossible, next to impossible up until now, because according to all the reporting that I've come across, neither of these two factions within the GOP have committed any of these negotiations to paper until just now. Um, just just uh, moments before uh, muting the news and getting ready to go live on the air, there was, uh, and I forget which channel this was on, um, but there was some reporting uh, coming from aides and, and people supposedly close to the negotiation um, that the two sides of this, of this GOP fracture have only just now, quote unquote, started to trade paper, which means that they've They've actually exchanged written statements for the first time. Now, it's important to keep in mind that they have had, as a party, months to get their shit together on this issue, right? And um, as listeners may or may not be aware, each party votes for their own leadership 
in advance, you know, privately behind closed doors in advance of this debate, right? Hakeem is, as, as we might recall, Hakeem Jeffries, um, succeeded Pelosi, uh, in an internal, uh, vote. The, the Democrats all united around Jeffries and boom, um, so there's been no no waffling on their side, at least not that I've noticed. Uh, the only like like drifting away of some votes seemed to happen last night at the end of a very long session, after adjourning for a dinner break and then returning to session only to vote to adjourn for the rest of the night, which was kind of ridiculous to me. Um, why didn't they just adjourn until the next day the first time? Um, but at that final vote to adjourn, it seemed like a couple of Democrats voted present, which is a way to vote and participate in the vote, but not vote for anything, um, which is what allowed them to adjourn. If those two Democrats had voted to block the, the notion uh, of adjournment or the movement, the, what is it? Is it, no, is it? I forget what the correct terminology is there, but the, the proposal to adjourn for the evening, they would they could have blocked it completely. And then they would have been forced to take yet another vote. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about how long this will take. Um, and early on, there were some optimistic statements about how this will only take a few hours or maybe at most a few days. Now it seems um, that some of the more moderate uh, speculation is pegging this at at least a week. A week of this inviting. Okay? Okay. Some are worriedly worried, some people who are, you know, being quoted as, as expressing this idea that this might take longer. I don't remember exactly how long um, it took that 1800s fight to get resolved, but it was over 100 ballots, right? Which is what they call the voting process. There's no paper voting, they just vote by, uh, you know, local statement in the chamber. Uh, okay, well... I've been rambling long enough. Let's take a little musical break. But before we do, let's let's just so that everyone knows what's going on. Here's the list of uh, the opposition block inside of the GOP that is preventing McCarthy from uh, uh, achieving this this nomination. Uh, and these these technically guys, none of these guys have been sworn in. Nobody has been sworn in, right? So. Republican uh, representative elect Andy Biggs of Arizona, Dan Bishop of North Carolina, Lauren Boebert of Colorado, um, Josh uh, Brashane of Oklahoma, Michael Cloud of Texas, uh, Eli Crane of Arizona, Andrew Clyde of Georgia, uh, Byron Donalds of Florida, Matt Gates of Florida. Bob Good of Virginia, Paul Gozar of Arizona, Andy Harris of, oh crap, what is MD? Maryland. Um, Anna Paulina Luna of Florida, Mary Miller of Illinois, Ralph Norman of South Carolina, Andy Ogles of Tennessee, Scott Perry of Pennsylvania, Ma, Matt Rosendale of Montana, Chip Roy of Texas, and Keith Self of Texas. Now, it isn't 100% across the board on all these, but most of these guys, most of these uh, 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 representatives elect, they're not guys, right? Sorry, forgive me. Most of these politicians are Trump acolytes, um, MAGA enthusiasts or, or believers, and, um, and insurrection supporters or even participant participants. Um, and several, you know, a few of these are kind of still clouded by, um, by controversy. The most egregious of which, in my opinion, is, uh, Matt Gates. Like, he's still under investigation for sex trafficking, I think. Uh, so it's mind-boggling that he's enjoying such, um, such apparent power right now in Congress. But that's a whole separate issue, Right. We can we can do a whole episode. We can do a whole mini series on the hypocrisy of the GOP's um, obsession, especially at the base of you know the uh, sexual fixations. Uh, as one meme recently snarkily pointed out, uh, he, he, you know. 
On shows like To Catch a Predator, all kinds of people have been exposed as predators. Faith leaders, politicians, etc. But n- I, 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 there's no... There's no, I have no recollection, and not that I watch that show consistently or anything, but I'm aware of it, and I have occasionally dipped into episodes. But you know, according to this meme, not once uh, in the in the context of the show has a a drag queen been been caught, right? But I digress. The, the GOP and its history of bizarre levels of hypocrisy is a whole other situation. Okay. So these 20 representatives elect have positioned themselves um, to obstruct their own party in order to get things that they want. Now, some of the requests that I'm aware of, some of the demands that they've made are really nepotistic and, and sort of obviously about power grabs, especially the demand for um, special seating on subcommittees, etc., like, but the, beyond the scope of that, there's so many questions uh, and so many potential implications about this logger gem, which we'll talk about on the other side of this new hot news track from DJ Z and myself, Mr. Zeppo, Bending Time Zones Permitting, a chalk dinosaur remix live audio, digital asset, live-to-tape entertainment track for your enjoyment. Please enjoy, and by all means, get up and and boogie-woogie if you feel like it. We'll be right back after this track. Discotex Synthetica that we play here on this show. Please be sure to go and visit soundcloud.com forward slash Mr. Zeppo to enjoy all of the tracks without me talking through them. cloud.com forward slash Mr. Zeppo. And to explore all of the other content creation projects that I am involved in or that I'm generating all by myself, actually, uh, head on over to solo.to forward slash Mr. Zeppo. Okay, so the craziest part of all of this to me is how McCarthy 
and those who are opposing him are all hardcore Trump acolytes, right? Believers in Trump. Whether they really believe in him or not is a whole nother question, but they present themselves, they represent themselves as dedicated, committed Trumptopians. And yet here they are completely at odds with each other, right? Trump's endorsements seem to have been completely flaccid, ineffective, and meaningless to the Never McCarthy uh, coalition. And, and and this coalition are... It's, and this is the weirdest part to me. They're, they're not just ignoring Trump. They're trolling him back. Uh, at least it seems so. I think that Matt Gates randomly voting for Trump, I think maybe once or twice in only the mo- one, some of the most recent ballots. Um, that feels a bit trolly. And then, I th- was it was it Boebert? Boebert literally said something, and I don't have the quote in front of me. I, I watched it, though, live. She, she, she called out Trump and McCarthy, saying, guys, there's no votes here, and we're not going to give them to him. Right? Like, that's not the exact quote, but I remember thinking, like, wow... I sat back and whatever she said specifically, what it told me, what it said to me was Boebert was drawing a line. Like, this is the Freedom Caucus slash MAGA movement. And Trump, you got to realize that McCarthy's not getting it, right? And that just has, well, I don't know. It just prompts mind-bogglingly weird questions and, and potential implications. Okay, so it's worth remembering that all of this really began with the emergence of the Tea Party, at, right around the same time as the emergence of, of um, the Occupy Wall Street slash just Occupy Everything movement uh, over on the uh, on the opposition side, in the Democratic side. Or, well, rather, they were a little bit more broadly, uh, more of a broad coalition of Democrats and others who just opposed what the Republicans were doing. Um, and I said back in the day, and I wish I had, like, I don't, I don't have the staff nor the time to pull quotes from my own show. And I apologize for that. I really wish that I could organize myself enough to do that. But without a little help, it's, it's really an uphill battle. Um, so you got to trust me on this or go and dig it up for yourself. Um, but I said way back in the beginning of the podcast, which wasn't in real time at then, but it, I started this podca- podcast just days and or weeks after Trump announced that he was running. Um, and, and the whole Tea Party thing had already kind of started to evolve and change from its original configuration. And, and as, as I pointed out in those early days of the podcast, the thing that the Tea Party did that the Occupy movement never seemed to wrap their heads around was to organize politically and get members from within in their own uh, movement nominated and elected and, and into office. Right, and that Tea Party movement grew into, I think, if I'm if I'm understanding all the patterns correctly, is it gave birth to the Freedom Caucus uh, and a few other sort of like s- similarly associated subgroups, um, which I collectively call the Trumptopian movement. Right, so it's it's wild to me um, that people like Bobert. People like Gates, who only, who only, he didn't even nominate Trump, Matt Gates, right? He voted for him as an other, which is one of the options that they have in this kind of voting process. They can vote for the, either of the people nominated by, from either party, um, to be the Speaker of the House. They can nominate people from within the House chamber or from outside of it. Um, and they can just sort of, uh, protests vote for some someone other than the nominees. Uh, and so Gates was curiously supporting uh, the primary alternates um, until this most recent, I think he's done it twice now, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, um, voting for uh, Trump. And, and Bobert's, uh, Bo- Lauren Bobert has spoken a couple times while nominating um, First, the guy from Florida. What was his name? What's the guy from Florida? Byron Donalds. And then she moved over to, oh, I forget the guy's name that she 
switched over to. And curiously, I think the guy that she is now promoting or supporting isn't even on the list of 20, which is curious. Um, I could be wrong about that. I just can't remember that guy's name. But her statements directed at Trump and at, at McCarthy, it's just, it's just so bizarre to me that the, this Trump was supposed to unify and empower the Republican Party, reshape it in his own image. And for a while there, it seemed like it was really happening, right? Um, leadership kowtowing to him, uh, the, the rest of the party uh, apparently kowtowing to him, or going at the GOP went out of their way to purge as many Republicans that made any kind of statement or stance against Trump. Right? You'd think right now, uh, I'm actually really surprised that this log jam is happening. I keep wanting to say logger jam, which I don't think is correct, but this log jam situation was a little bit surprising, but it also sort of makes sense. Like I said, the GOP has been the party of obstructionism and opposition for a long time, which is a sad tragedy to me because, to the best of my understanding, the the authentic, patriotic intention is to have multiple parties collaborating with each other and finding common ground, not obstructing each other indefinitely, right? But that's a whole other debate. Um, this is another thing I said way back in the day. Uh, when Trump first announced he was running for office, I said on my podcast that I strongly suspected that the motivation behind that effort to, to support, nominate, and elect Trump was motivated by a desire uh, to, to effectively push the political pendulum as hard to the extreme right as possible, right? And what have we seen since then? Even, even folks on the left, and I mean this from a public, you know, from observational stance of me observing public discourse, um, are drifting gently to the right, maybe not necessarily on policy, uh, but to me, seemingly on, um, on how they engage in public discourse, how they treat each other. If there's one thing that Trump has successfully achieved, it has been the transformation of a political party into a party of public trolling. Now, politics was messed up enough as it, as it was before all that, and now it's been reduced to this, where, I mean, we can still sort of talk about the policy talking points of the GOP in an abstract way because of the long history of the things that they've pushed for. But in terms of an actual platform articulated and expressed on paper, it's in sort of thin on the ground, if not straight up missing since Trump took over the GOP. Um, someone recently challenged me to list uh, right-wing issues. And I'm like, there's the obvious boring old, old regular ones from, you know, being quote-unquote pro-life, which is a hypocritical stance, the way they execute it, in my opinion— um, because if they were really pro-life, it was re if it was really about children's lives, they would also be providing for those children, which they clearly think is bad to do from, you know, every kind of social service that they strip away, et cetera. Um, you know, gun rights, et cetera. Their typical topping points, talking points are obvious and they're still being bandied about. But in terms of like, a, like, what is the actual political policy-based platform? Despite a lot of ambitious or uh, altruistic-sounding talk coming from the GOP, 
both sides of this new division, um, what they've effectively worked to achieve is a consolidation of power and a perpetual obstruction of the Democratic Party. Now, I'm not defending the Democrats, right? Everyone always assumes that if I'm speaking in, against the Republican Party, I must be blindly defending the Democrats. Or if I'm criticizing the Democrats, I must be blinding, blindly defending the Republicans. I'm doing neither. I focus my discussion on the, the, the political right right now because despite all of the noise coming from them, it is that party that seems to be acting flagrantly, irresponsibly, hypocritically on the very surface of everything. We can dig into the, 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 the problematic issues below the surface of the Democratic Party. Happy to. But it's meaningless to do that, in my opinion. Whilst the GOP is going through this mini internal civil war, Um, so here we are, and effectively, I wasn't wrong, right? Like, I, I'm not the kind of person who loves to pat myself on the back, and I certainly never pretend that I predicted things. I'm not in that prediction game. Um, and there's reasons, but there's a pin on the cork board, talked about it before. And I, you know, there's so many pins on the cork board about this issue in regards to, um, Trump how he's reshaped the GOP party into a sort of distillate of all the worst possible features about it from before he invaded it. Um, like, that's a whole nother thing. To round out this discussion, um, it's been interesting during this three-day process, right? And as I pointed out before, they can't get not, they cannot get anything done right now as the rules stand until they elect someone. Um, listening to the nomination speeches, the Democratic Party has been curiously consistent. They've keeping things really simple, pointing out the quote-unquote bipartisan achievements that have been achieved during uh, Biden's administration and speaking in warm, glowing terms about Hakeem Jeffries' his character, his background, etc. The GOP have curiously focused on talking points fixated about how, quote-unquote, broken Congress seems to be. What I find hilarious about that is that it totally ignores the reality that the GOP, the party that they're trying to bully into going in the direction they want to go, has been the party of obstructionism and trolling has been evolving into this for decades, right? Like, the, the, the GOP is reaping what they've sowed. And it's fascinating to me that they're split up about it, right? That they're, they're potentially going to live out a political, quote-unquote, fantasy civil war. Not a real one. I really, I, I doubted it back in, remember back when there was Lots of chit-chat and chatter about an actual physical civil war here in the United States. And I just, I groaned at that and kind of poked fun at it and, you know, called it out for what it is. Violence fear-mongering or fear-based violence-mongering. But, uh, but a political civil war seems to be brewing, right? And um, the Democrats seem prepared to just sit back and let it happen. And we can debate whether or not that's the best option, whether or not that's that's the most politically feasible or responsible path to take, but that's a whole other discussion. Let's let's set it aside for now. In fact, let's let's just run through some questions that we don't really have answers for yet. There's that question, and there's also like, what does this really mean for Trump? Right? He launched his campaign with statements like, I alone can fix this. Has he fixed it? Has he fixed anything? Now we can debate his policy achievements. 
And in all honesty, as I've said before on the show, there are some things that the Trump administration achieved that I can't really disagree with. That I'm like, okay, that was all right. That was fine. Both parties should be able to get around that, you know, get, get behind it. But those have been in the minority. Like, intensely so. But let's be honest, right? Trump did not successfully complete his attempt to reform or reshape the GOP in his own image, right? He has not successfully made the GOP the party of Trump. It, it felt like he was almost about to get there, especially when McCarthy flip-flopped on his own holding him accountable for January 6th. But here we are, um, right? The GOP has a razor-thin majority in the House. And instead of, as Trump curiously pointed out, taking the win, rallying behind the, the, the candidate that won the internal nomination in the, in the GOP, here they are insisting on obstructing themselves and, and, and quite humorously claiming that this is really good for the American people. Now, we can, we can debate that until the cows come out. Right, But here's a simple reality. The House is completely offline. Which means the other chamber of Congress can't do shit. Right? Can't, can't really achieve anything. And it also effectively pauses anything going on at the federal level. Um, and should some sort of critical event happen... We don't have the House of Representatives ready, established, sworn in, organized, and prepared to deal with it. I don't know about you, but that seems like a pretty absurd position to take and maintain. Especially, as uh, some speculation indicates, they're prepared to do it for months on end. If they hold out on this for weeks, even if it's just three weeks, what kind of negative impacts is that going to have on everything else? And what does that mean for other challenging votes in, wherein the GOP is divided within itself about what to do, right? Um, does the GOP, do, do, do either camps of the GOP realize and I kind of brought this up early uh, ahead of, of me wanting to get through this list of questions. Do they realize that no matter who they elect for speaker, if they integrate and implement the, the demands of these 20 holdouts, these 20 never McCarthy representatives elect, then they're going to desperately need the DNC to get anything done. Because these 20 rep uh, representatives, which by the way, only represent apparently about 10% of the GOP members of the House, if I'm not mistaken, they're always going to have just enough power to make it next to impossible for a GOP uh, legislative initiative to get through without conceding to and giving everything to this block, this MAGA mini coalition. Um, so I, I, I don't, and, and, and that sort of cuts both ways. If that MAGA coalition grows within the, the GOP, which is what they want, obviously, even as they deny Trump betraying their supposed absolute loyalty to him, and let's remember, Trump personally demands direct personal loyalty from those he endorses. Which, by the way, asterisk slash pin on the corkboard, direct individual personal loyalty to one politician is the exact opposite of what American patriotism is supposed to be about. 
we've talked about that on the show before, and I'm sure we'll have to discuss it again. Okay, um, let's start to wrap things up here, and we'll play a little bit of more music to play it out. Um, so, well, let's play the music now, and then we'll come back and talk about possible paths to resolution. I, there's probably some more uh, questions, like, but, I mean, it's all... All the possible questions that can't be answered right now is are implications, long-term implications as to how the GOP will be able to function, right? Will they be able to function cohesively if they fail to resolve this in a meaningful way? Will Trump continue to try to coalesce power in the GOP? If the mini, the mini MAGA coalition or conference or whatever you want to call them if this group of 20 doesn't doesn't grow if they fail to win what does that mean for for trump's future as this supposed leader of the gov party what does that mean for his you know independent of all the legal issues he's you know uh, facing what does this mean for his next run for office I don't have answers to that. I'm throwing those questions out there to like percolate through the public discourse. Okay, one more track of music and then we're going to come back and discuss some, what I see is the, the, the most realistic possible paths to a resolution to this log jam. Uh, but in the meantime, please enjoy the following track, Deepening the Empty Space Time Void, a space chill step remix live digital audio asset improvised live to tape recording for your ear hole pleasuring. Okay, friends, let's discuss possible paths to a resolution to this log jam of intransigence that we're witnessing in the House chamber. Um, I'm going to kick off with the craziest suggestion I've heard supposedly being floated around right now. Now, I don't know that this is something being taken seriously or not, but, and I, I, and I don't know... To what degree any of these things are being discussed in in chambers or in in closed rooms? But here's what I here's the things I see uh, as potential ways to just end this. None of which seem incredibly likely, by the way. The craziest idea I've heard articulated is a radical rule change about electing the speaker. As things have stood for I don't know how long, the House Chamber cannot begin work until a speaker is elected. Then all members can be 
sworn in. Committees and subcommittees can be organized, chairs and gavels assigned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and policy work can begin. The craziest idea I've heard floated is a change to those rules. If the House dramatically changes the rule that says you cannot start work until you've elected a speaker, which, ironically, they could not do until they elect a speaker, um, in theory, that would allow for future uh, generations of newly elected members of the House to swear themselves in and begin legislation without having to elect a speaker first, which, I, I don't know, that seems to be its own recipe for chaos. And like I said, I don't know how strong or frivolous these ideas may be in regards to what's actually being discussed. But they do seem to be the only possible ways to solve this in an expedient way. Now, the, this first one I started with is like the craziest sounding things. And like I said, it wouldn't be that expedient because it would have to, it could only happen until after a speaker is elected and all these processes are completed. But it would make the next session of Congress potentially, you know, be able to expedite all of this. But who knows? Um, now, these are all, re I guess I'm reading these in order of unlikeliness. Like, this is the most unlikely. This is the next unlikely. If 20 Democrats were suddenly to change their votes and support McCarthy. Perhaps in another era. You know, and, and I really, I, I wouldn't know which presidential administration to pick where this might have been possible. But I, I just, I don't even, I can't begin to imagine Right, as how things stand and how the Democratic Party has been behaving in, in really cohesive unity right now. And that's it's a curious thing. Um, one of my critiques from a broad picture perspective about the DNC, the, yeah, the DNC has been that they they generally value um, open discourse about this agreement so much that they often fail to organize and unify around a position fast enough to deal with the Republican Party, which, for whatever reasons, has traditionally been a little bit more cohesively unified in the past. They've managed to get into lockstep, generally speaking, much quicker. Uh, but that's clearly dramatically changing. And now it seems, you know, the tables are turning on that. The next um, sort of unlikely thing that could resolve this pretty quickly is if just six, and I believe that number is correct, but, you know, for s simplicity's sake and for, like, um, you know, like, being above and beyond, let's just say ten. Um, but I think the minimum number would have to be e either five with one Republican member refusing to vote claiming to be absent, or being absent, rather, or voting just present, in other words, a no vote. So five or six GOP members could, theoretically speaking, say, fuck all this, let's vote for Jeffries, he's been in the lead ten times in the row, right? Hakeem Jeffries has outperformed everybody. He just needs six more votes, with every, on every ballot, he's just needed six more votes to win the speakership. So this is in the middle of my list because it seems way more likely than the previous two, but slightly less likely than the next two. Um, which are this. The internal opposition, the, the MAGA coalition could nominate and, the ra and then rally the votes for some kind of alternate candidate. And this is what they've been exploring. Um, I forget who they opened with. I think it was Jim Jeffries, maybe? One of those guys that's like, how is he still in office? Um, given the amount of legal scrutiny that he's under. But that's a, neither here nor there. Uh, no, I just said the wrong name. Whatever name I said, ditch it. But whoever they voted for first, they then sort of abandoned him. I think mostly because, from what I understand, he didn't want to be nominated. Um, what is that guy's name? I can see his face right now. Big goofy smile, thinning hair, uh, very, very sort of like, um, 
eccentric positioning. But anyways, whatever he, whatever his name was, they, 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 the, the this opposition block temporarily coalesced around um, their nominee from Florida, uh, Byron. Oh, where is his name? I've got his name over here. So, oh no, my mouse is on the wrong screen. Come here. Uh, Byron, Byron, Byron. Sorry, I never, I had no good at remembering, never mind memorizing names. Byron Donalds from Florida. But that, that solidarity has broken up. And now certain members of this MAGA coalition um, have splintered off, you know, primarily Lauren Burbert, who's now nominating another guy whose name totally escapes me. And, you know, Matt Gates voting for Trump once or twice and a couple of other people. Um, one representative whose name I can't remember either has been voting present. So just, you know, non-participatory. I'm here, but I'm not voting uh, a, a couple of times now. And um, and who knows what's going to happen, especially if they decide to just keep doing this over and over and over again throughout the rest of the weekend. Now, as many people have pointed out on both sides of the ideological spectrum, the absolute simplest thing that would resolve this instantly is for McCarthy to just bow out. Now, who knows? He might surprise everybody and do that before the end of the day. I don't know. But as of the last time I checked into the reporting, he has made statements as of this morning, that he's not budging an inch. So, like, the biggest question here, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, where is that one statement? And I don't, I don't know where this quote com comes from. Some, someone, uh, and I don't remember what channel it was, and or what's, you know, what show it was, but someone made reference to the, to an, sort of general idea. Uh, they are obviously paraphrasing and not getting the quote exact, so neither am I, forgive me. And in fact, I probably changed the wording to, to put it in the way I would say it. But in the face of an immovable object, only a fool remains stubbornly obstinate. You can say that Mr. Zeppo said that because whoever originally said whatever they said, it's obviously been telephoned away to this statement. But this begs the question, who's the greater fool right now? McCarthy? Or the 20 folks persistently voting against him. Or Trump, right? For thinking that he, that his grip on the GOP is as tight and as all-inclusive as he might have thought just days ago. Because his people, his nominees, the people he endorsed, that successfully got, you know, stayed in office or got elected in office because he lost Plenty of his nominees, his hand-chosen, um, you know, MAGA hat-wearing, uh, insurrectionist-supporting, um, election-denying candidates lost. <laughs> the red wave did not happen. Uh, so, so here we are, left with a crazy situation which may get drawn out for an unpredictable amount of time. Now, I'm going to laugh if as soon as I get off the air, I go and check the news and it's over, in which case I'll, I will immediately jump back on uh, and share my thoughts about that. But this is something that's going to have lasting implications, most of which I think are kind of impossible to predict right now. Like, what does it mean that Lauren Berbert is, is, is standing up to Trump. Like, what does that mean? If Trump successfully gets nominated and wins the election and gets into office, what will it mean then? Will all of these folks who are refusing to follow Trump's suggestion to just take the win and support Kevin McCarthy will they then realize that, oh, wow, they have more power in the MAGA community than Trump does? I mean, is, that's, is that where this is going? There's already been, uh, in recent weeks and months, lots of debate about whether or not Ron DeSantis is going to, to ascend to greater notoriety and, and public power in the MAGA community 
than Trump. Um, so there's just way, way too many questions to even begin to answer. But if there's anything that is clear to me now, and you know, obviously people can agree or disagree here. I'm, I, I never, by the way, demand blind agreement. I'm here to have discussions and share my insight, my voice into the public discourse so that other people can question what I got to say and critically think about it for themselves. Tragically, most people don't listen to what I say with an open mind. They scan for keywords to then get triggered about and yell, you know, their pre-programmed opposition. But that's a whole other discussion. But I've been on the cork board. I've talked about it before. I'm probably going to talk about it again. But if there's one thing I think that this proves, um, or that this indicates, I don't know if it proves anything, but if there's one thing that I'm concerned with now is that the GOP isn't really the GOP, right? It's two parties struggling under one tent. It's the Trumptopian party and whatever is left of the, the old school Republican party. And they've been sort of, it's been like two parties in one trench coat to switch up analogies. Um, and I think to stretch that analogy um, before now, one could say that, it, you know, the two parties in the one trench coat, the Trumptopian party was the bottom half and the GOP party was sort of standing on them, or at least they thought so. Um, but now it really feels like after a rough and tumble tussle under the trench coat, it's, it's the MAGA coalition that's now climbing onto the shoulders uh, uh, you know, of the GOP to sort of be the top micro coalition or internal coalition in, in this analogy of two parties inside of one trench coat. Will they continue this bizarre game of pretending to be one cohesive political party? Or will they push this, this bifurcation to the extreme that an, a political civil war actually happens. Will the, the MAGA coalition try to push everybody that's trying to preserve the GOP as the GOP out of the GOP, right? Which is effectively what's been happening. So many former Republicans are now independents or it's gone full Democrat, right? In response to what they can no longer tolerate about what Trump has done to the GOP as a political party. I don't know. I don't pretend to have foreknowledge. I don't pretend to be an expert in any of this. But as an astute observer, as someone who's been fascinated by watching politics from a nonpartisan point of view, all of this is really bizarre. And, I, and not terribly healthy in my opinion, right? Like I said about Trump, the only person undermining Trump from the get-go, from when he entered politics, the only person who has effectively undermined Trump is Trump himself through his own hypocrisy and word and action. Um, and quite frankly, it now seems that he's normalized that in the GOP. So now that the, the only... Like the Trump's the, the the Democratic Party is not having to do anything besides stand firm and vote and you know exactly the same over and over again. Um the longer this goes on, like God forbid, let's say this goes on for a month, the worse shape the GOP slash Trumptopian trench coat party is going to get like the more toxic the more divided and the more um self-undermining the republican party is going to become and i put republican in quotes because like i said it's 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 metastasizing has been pretty much since trump ascended to power and if if we get to that point where it's completely at odds with itself. It's only sort of just beginning to show the signs of tearing itself apart. But if a month from now, two months from now, 
they've completely uh, split apart and but but pretended to you know maintain this illusion of being under the same tent or being wrapped up in the same trench coat. It's gonna mean chaos, right? I think I could be wrong. I don't pretend to be absolutely right about anything. In fact, the only thing I got to say about absolutist thinking is that it is that absolutist thinking, absolutist logic, rarely, rarely is ever absolutely true. Pin on the cardboard. Either way, friends, I don't think that any of this pretends positive things for Trump and his goals. This seems to be a very unauspicious moment for Trump and his movement. But who knows? I could be wrong. It would be mind-blowing if after however many days or weeks of this struggle, somehow the MAGA coalition doubles, trebles, quadruples its presence in the GOP publicly, overtly, loudly. And, you know, and continues to try to carve out uh, anyone, push out uh, and exorcise, exile anybody in the GOP who refuses to kowtow to Trump. But that's the crazy thing. If that's what the GOP faction wanted to do, Right, you would. I would think that they would all be uniformly in line with McCarthy, given how McCarthy has bent over backwards to suck up to Trump and to do what Trump's bidding. Right, so it's. I'm. I'm just left kind of like wow. <laughs> just in. I didn't think that the Trumptopian movement in the GOP party could shock me any more or surprise me uh, any more times. But I'm not so much shocked as sort of like bemused, bemusedly confused as to what it is they think they're doing. I think that they're, I think that they might think that they're coalescing power in their corner, but I think that in reality, they are effectively diluting the power of the GOP overall, of the right wing of the two-party system. But then again, you all know, if you've been listening and paying attention, that I've got some very unconventional thoughts about the two parties. Primarily, hashtag, two wings, one bird. And that's what I got to say about that. As always, friends, thank you for listening. And I hope to, uh, I hope to, uh, continue coming at you a little bit more daily and a little bit less almost in 2023. Please stay tuned for more. And by all means, please share your thoughts, opinions, questions, etc. on the various social media pages associated to the show. Even if you disagree, the only thing I ask is to keep it civil and civilized. Anybody and everybody who comes at me with nothing but meaningless trolling uh, and distractionary nonsense will be called out for it. All right, friends. It's going to be an interesting, if only slightly tedious, non-roller coaster log jam ride. Uh, because although it's fascinating, it's also sort of like it's, it, it, they're just doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Right? Right? And what's that saying about doing the same thing over again and expecting different results? Until next time, friends, I hope that peace, love, and grooviness blossoms in your heart. I've been your host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. And these have been my thoughts, questions, and concerns on the state of the Trumptopian movement. And that is... The latest madness from behind the orange wall. Thank you for listening to GMT, a special segment. 
of the almost daily Zencast. I really should re-record the opener and outro, the intro and outro for this show. Watch this space, folks. This is definitely weird and bizarre territory. <laughs>